Born in fire and molded into thy new form, an ounce of agonized soul heated with flames of scorn and shaped into the pillar of salt and sand on which we shall build our kingdom of creation. This is your agony reborn. These are your hot takes. But yeah, so a while back I did a hot take video and here I have come back to do yet another. I've gathered up plenty of takes to tackle, so sit back, relax, and let's steam. Also, while editing this video, I realized my voice sounds a little funny or tired at times. I think it's probably just recovering from whatever funky bug I had last week, so if you notice, that's why. Anywho, let's get started. Beppins writes, As much as I like him, Eclipse didn't need to happen. Chica and Monty both needed that characterization more. At this point, Monty serves more as a force in the plotline of Bonnie's decommissioning than his own character. He had the ability to be the most interesting Glamrock, and they'll likely leave him and Chica in the dust again for more popular characters and fan service. So, I agree, but with a few buts. Monty and Chica definitely needed more character building than the daycare attendant. But, I think folks would have noticed if he didn't appear, just like how DJ's disappearance was pretty noticeable. And with how short Eclipse's section was, I don't think his addition really contributed to Monty and Chica's lack of building, especially Monty who appears in many more sections but has no further building personality-wise. I understand why Ruin focused on the more beloved characters, but it is a shame because I think you're right. I don't think we'll likely see much more of Glamrock Chica or Monty. We'll probably get a new Chica variant in the next band, and maybe another Monty someday, but this was really the place for the last hurrah for them, so unless they both get something to do in Help Wanted 2, like Baby and a Nerd in Help Wanted 1, this might be the end of the line for them. Scout Burst writes, Hot Take. This series is borderline inaccessible for newcomers if you got into it past FNAF 6. I say this as someone who was in it from the beginning until Sister Location and read The Silver Eyes, and then took a break until Security Breach. Sure, you can read the books, that adds up quickly, get them through libraries, and you can watch some videos in an attempt to catch up, but a lot of info this fandom accepts or as fact or as evidence for popular theories comes from things like Scott's website updates that are practically lost time unless you want to dig through video archives of 2015. It's not even fun to catch up at this point. A new book comes out and all I can think is, gods, I hope this isn't actually canon. I don't want any more lore implications. I like this series a lot, but I'm starting to get burned out on everything happening. I don't know if others feel the same, but I would give anything for the series to be simple again. You're not alone, I can tell you that. I love FNAF, but, and I've been here since the beginning, and sometimes it feels like I'm taking a college elective trying to keep up with everything, especially since we almost get no confirmation for what is and what isn't actually important to the greater story. And even if it is, we almost never see it in action, you know? You know? It's a little overwhelming. And that doesn't mean I don't like FNAF. I do. But I hate when a book comes out and I find myself getting lectured about how it changes everything, the whole franchise. It's all different now. Yeah, well, that's the stuff that got me into the franchise. I don't want to be retaught about how wrong I was because I followed the info we had at the time. Whoa, sorry. I didn't think the salt was coming that fast. <clears throat> Long story short, I agree. I think simple is better, and I think supplementary material should be a bonus, not a requirement. DJ Deadpig writes, Guess I'm one of the few people who thinks FNAF 6 is the worst in the original saga. The game plays out just like a joke at first, and then the tycoon sections kill the tension. The nights are incredibly slow and boring, with the only tension coming from the good sound design. Most of the characters besides Scrap Baby and Lefty are sloppily designed, like Afton or Molten Freddy. The salvaging sections are the only remotely scary part of the game for me, and the game isn't some loose end typing up masterpiece that everyone says it is with things like The Box, Midnight Motorist, 87, etc. going unsolved. Though I believe it was a fine way to end the saga, Afton 100% should not have died at the end of FNAF 6 and his death felt incredibly underwhelming and out of nowhere. Bringing Afton back doesn't even undo Henry's work like all the reviews of Security Breach were saying, as Afton was mostly a side thought for Henry. Setting the children free was his main goal, and so far it seems like that hasn't been undone. 
Mimic alone, in my opinion, is a prime example of people not understanding FNAF 6 or Security Breach. Not understanding their own series, as Mimic mimicking Afton doesn't really change everything in regard to their criticism. As it still basically is the same as William Deep Down, just with a new coat of paint. I don't believe the Mimic is burn trap, but if he was, that in my opinion proves the double standard people give as it is not okay if the OG villain comes back, but a new villain who's more or less a carbon copy of him is good. Even if Mimic has his own lore, most people don't even read the books, so to some he's just Afton with a robot. Yeah, that and Sister Location is where FNAF's comedic tone started to come in stronger. In Sister Location, it was ignorable enough. In Pizzeria Simulator, it's like, it's like when you're venturing into a scary building where you know there's a murderer and killer robots inside, and five children are missing who might be dead, and then your friend suddenly shoots the Emperor's new groove meme. Now that might be a joke, but that's actually the best way to describe the tonal shift. Especially in Pizzeria Simulator, it seems to go from really goofy to really dark, and it can be jarring. But I do agree for the most of what you say about FNAF 6. I myself didn't really like Pizzeria Simulator's gameplay. Ironically, my favorite part of the game was Fruity Maze. Now, my biggest problem with folks saying that FNAF 6 is the perfect ending is that it's, it's FNAF 3's ending, but it was updated with Scott's book characters and fan favorite baby. And you know, I agree with the Afton Death thing. You don't kill a man in a fire and bring him back just to kill him in another fire. You have to at least improve on the method of death. Like, why not a fire in holy water? Or a vampire steak? Or rip his soul out? Something. You brought him back. Don't do the same thing. In defense of the whole security breach, burn trap runes, FNAF 6 take, at the time, we only had security breach and that seemed to be what it was implying. I mean, look at this thing. Does it look like an original character? Especially when Afton changed so drastically between 3 and 6. And yes, I totally see and agree with the double standard. Mimic isn't as huge of a deviation as is wanted to be believed. Walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Even if it tells me it's a goat, that doesn't mean I'm going to be able to milk it. And yeah, a lot of people who really love the Mimic haven't read the books. Or at least don't understand what was stated in the books. Because they say things that really weren't in the stories, but were probably in a popular theory. God, like, there was an epilogue that proved Mimic was Burn Trap because he crushed a woman's body climbing into a suit, except it was a dog animatronic, and Mimic just climbed back out later. So yeah, that wasn't a Burn Trap reveal, but everyone was saying it was. I gotta stop, I'm burning time whining. So yeah, I agree with most of this. Coco writes, I really don't know if it's just me, but I actually think that Toy Chica is way too sexualized in fan art. And not just the ones that are intended to be a little spicy, and most likely all her fan art, even the normal ones. I also don't think she deserves the title Thick Chicken that some people in the community gave her. I mean, she isn't even that thick. She is still a robot made for children, not adults. I will give you that. Toy Chica is actually not really thick. Like, she has some thighs, but there's not significantly bigger or curvier hips than, like, even Toy Bonnie, really. I sort of agree as well with the sexualization. I haven't seen a lot of Toy Chica fan art, but yeah, I know there is a lot out there, and there's a lot of it that's mature. And there's not really much I can say on it. I can definitely see how it can be annoying, because I feel that same way about Circus Baby, who is often given similar treatment. Though I don't have such strong feelings for Toy Chica, that is a good point, and it's kind of a double standard for me to ignore it. However, I will say that FNAF has gone out of its way to, um, encourage this. Chica's high school days with Toy Chica as a curvy, sexy school minor, uh, Freddy in space, stuff like that. And I know it's all tropey and tongue-in-cheek, I'm not saying it's bad, but I am saying it doesn't really help the fan art situation, you know? Number two. I think it's kind of dumb that Elizabeth went from her own independent villain who was manipulative and actually has a reason to scoop Michael, to just some daddy issued little girl who would go over dead bodies to make her father proud. Yeah, I hate it too. Technically they did it with Charlie too, instead of villain it was hero to helpless. Vanessa was a lackey with daddy issues too, and now Cassie has a hinted daddy who will probably be coming into the games. Above every decent female character, there's a daddy waiting to swoosh in. Number three, 
I think that the books and games are two different parallel universes. That's what Scott said in the beginning, and technically we haven't gotten any confirmation that they are or aren't, so maybe. Number 4. The novels should have ended with the Silver Eyes. Yeah, or at least the next books should have been their own thing and not trying to continue off of the Silver Eyes. And number 5. Remnant is overpowered. Remnant has basically erased death, so yeah, it's way overpowered. Anyone who isn't up to speed, in the books, Remnant can be used to resurrect the dead, heal flesh immediately, and make trash rebuild itself into a functional body. It's, uh, God's mana. Tiger Cat writes, Depictions of Afton that make him a light-hearted funny guy or an ooh soft boy are effing awful. He murdered children. It's not okay, and at this point he's completely irredeemable if he ever was to begin with. I personally don't think so. 100% agree. I think there's absolutely no defending this man. The games and books show that everything he does, even the stuff he claims is for science, is really for a sadistic pleasure to torture others and benefit himself in some way. He's a monster. Unless you have like an AU where William wasn't the murderer, like an AU where William didn't kill anyone, or where Henry was the murderer instead, in which case, as long as you clarify that he's not killing kids or abusing his own, you're good. And to make a note here, biggest ooh soft boy Afton would probably be Dave Miller from Day Shift at Freddy's. But it should be noted that in those games, Dave is actually a brainwashed test subject of Henry Miller, who is the real William Afton of those games, acting very much like he does in canon. So in that case, there's still no funny man made of Will because the real Will in that game, Henry, is a repulsive and unforgivable monster. Also, how old is Will? 40? 50? Seems a little too old to be a soft boy to me. Super Lag Bro writes, The mimic is dumb and I don't like it. It feels very wishy-washy to me. As in, that it can do anything the writers want it to do because it can. Does the Mimic have a deeper motive or not? Ruin suggests it to be cunning, tricking Cassie, but the books state it to be dumb, just following its programming. The Mimic feels like a lazy cop-out to have a villain who can do anything they want just because, instead of making an actual new antagonist with actual motive and reasoning behind its actions. Yeah, see, this was the problem I had with Eleanor. Sans the weird non-existent connection to Baby and some of the infuriating plot elements. Mimic's like a less annoying Eleanor, but the idea of playing superheroes with a kid who just can make up any powers on the fly to always break the game doesn't sound like a lot of fun. The only benefit to Mimic is that he is comically bad at it, but that's only a benefit because it's funny. Planet Bumble writes, I think Security Breach has the best animatronic designs in the entire series. Like they actually look like kids would want to be around them and to idolize them unlike the earlier spooky animatronics. I mean... Yes and no. I do definitely think in-universe kids would find these animatronics cooler, and they would probably be more popular than the old designs. But I wouldn't say they're the best designs. The puppet, innard, balloon boy, gremlin or not, BB's got a great design that pops, and I can't say that I think all of the animatronics in Security Breach have the best designs. Most of them do have cool designs though, so agree and disagree. A preference thing. Jesterman writes, I've got one. People don't hate animatronics having personalities. They hate the way the personalities have gotten across. The Security Breach roster is very direct in the way their personalities are shown and leave very little up to interpretation. FNAF 1 was able to give just enough personality to the bots without setting anything in stone. Chica had a tilted head and wonky disposition, like a confused animal. Freddy was always angrily glaring at the camera, like he was mad he had to get off his stage and making it your problem. The animatronics had just enough personality to be endearing, while having just a little enough for fans to be able to interpret their own personalities for the characters. Modern FNAF doesn't have that kind of wiggle room with its characters. While this can sometimes pay off in the case of Baby, it can also give diminishing returns when some of the characters' newfound personalities don't make up for their lost fear factor. It's like when horror series go on for so long that the audience knows the villain's personality and the fear of the unknown is lost. This is a tricky one because I think, I think I disagree, but only partially. I mean, I saw folks giving the animatronics personality, but yeah, no, those details you're mentioning completely lost on me. I saw zombie, 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 shy pirate. And let me tell you, there becomes a point when your characters need a little more than that. Freddy, Chica, and Bonnie, the originals, stayed so static for so long 
that only only one of them got real full voice lines in FNAF AR, and his personality depicted there is bare. But, like you said, I feel like some of the best examples of this would be Baby. The problem with security... The problem with Security Breach is that the best, most fleshed out character in Security Breach is Freddy, and is his character is built totally towards the shattered segment that never happened. And I still stand by that. Freddy being super friendly and super nice and super goofy and being this overpowered weapon that eventually turns against you because that's missing at the end, Freddy comes out off as so over-the-top goody-goody that, I mean, I love Freddy, but he comes off so over-the-top goody-goody that it almost seems like a little too much. But when you take into account that there was supposed to be that section in there, it kind of balances it out. But I digress. But I, so yeah, I agree that all the personality, not all the personalities work, but I do feel like on the whole, the ones that did work and the benefits from those were worth the trade-off. I'm not the biggest fan of Security Breach. I think it had plenty of issues. But I've seen a lot of people really attach themselves to those animatronics. And you know what? Those are the characters who matter in the long run. The humans kind of all blend into a mush of relations to other characters. So yeah, I think it was worth taking the next step on the whole. Shan the Kid writes, The big debate on whether Monty did or didn't decommission Bonnie maliciously or by accident does not matter. Not one bit. It is quite literally the most painstakingly obvious red herring placed in Security Breach and Ruin. We were only given the opportunity to see Bonnie's body and resting site in Ruin. It's meant to just be another distraction to the more significant lore questions we should be considering. Bonnie's appearance in Ruin just added fuel to the fire that was the conspiracy of his disappearance in Security Breach. Other than personal opinions on the animatronics, the Bonnie Monty situation hardly affects the overarching plot. It's just a little side thing that gets people distracted. Think Jeremy, but on a bigger scale, and taking advantage of toying with our emotions. Damn you, Steel Wool. I should clarify that it's a totally interesting subplot, and I understand the want to figure out the answer for the sheer urge to solve a mystery, but some of y'all need to stop fighting for your lives defending, framing Monty, and pitying Bonnie. Okay, so I think you're on to something, admittedly. I think like Bonnie's appearance was more so to give a sort of answer to the fan base who were really curious about what happened to him. Where's Bonnie? Here he is. And that probably, eh, the fans are taking it a little more seriously than we should. Especially the rampant mom, Monty defending. Everyone's pretty sure Monty didn't do it. I think he did, and the truth is neither of us knows, and likely we'll never get a confirmation beyond what we've gotten. Because FNAF doesn't give an answer. It gives like a four or five and nudges us to guess the outcome. Additionally, I sort of disliked the direction that was taken for Roxanne and Ruin. And I've been a Roxy fan since the moment I saw the opening scene of her talking to herself in the mirror. I just immediately knew this robot was going to have some deep-rooted issues. Lol. I don't think they needed to make her character soft and the hero to be appealing. What I originally loved about Roxy was that she was flawed in many ways I could relate to. Not that she isn't flawed at all in Ruin, but I think they just tried too hard to make her appealing by completely doing a 360 on her nature and actions. It obviously worked since people love her now, but it's quite cheesy. Also, Sister Location's gameplay is mid. I refuse to elaborate. I'll elaborate. Night Force sucks and Baby talks too much. Anyway, continue. Sorry if this was lengthy. I'm feeling quite spicy. No problem. And I think you have a good point about Roxy. They might have softened her up a little too much because that roughness really was kind of refreshing. From the way she talks and acts in Ruin, it does feel a little like Girl Freddy. I'm not sure if it worked, per se. Everyone already loved Roxy. Roxy could have come out and eaten Cassie like the big bad wolf, and I feel like it might have only slightly affected her popularity. So they didn't really need to um, smooth her out. And yes, that gameplay do be a little weak. Still love Sister Location, though. Daniel Delaney writes, I think it's dumb that a significant chunk of fans seem to gloss over the fact that William, who dismantled the FNAF 1 animatronics, is on the same level, if not worse, than Gregory, breaking down the security breach animatronics for no reason at all. Like, what's the reason? Is it the fact that the FNAF 1 gang 
spirits lack AI or personality to be showcased and that the animatronics whose personalities are programmed into them? Or do they hate the poor homeless, mostly innocent kid that much? It's both. But like, yeah, it is a lot worse. William was destroying the robots who were his former victims. Children he murdered for no known reason. People say because Remnant, but that was not stated anywhere. Meanwhile, Gregory, who is defending himself? Monster. It's because these animatronics have sob stories, not even friendly characteristics. The only friendly one is Freddy, and Gregory doesn't smash him. People seem to forget that. We've got Zombie, rah, 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 and no one will miss you. Yeah, I think I wouldn't like them very much either. And yes, people do dislike kid characters more. One of the greatest examples I take is Chris Thorndike from Sonic X. I know this seems random, but when I first got onto the internet, I got really into Sonic X. Even though it had been like off TV for like 10 years, I got really into Sonic X for some reason. And for some reason, this obscure reference is my go-to. Everyone who's seen Sonic X, pretty much everyone, calls Chris annoying and is like, he ruined the series. But like, Sonic X contains some of the worst, most annoying representations of the Sonic characters. Cream is always getting herself into trouble, except for like one episode where she doesn't. Sonic is weirdly aloof most of the time, and Amy is the worst thing ever and a major clingy brat. But no, it's the kid. The most recent complaints I have heard about Chris Florendike that I can remember off the top of the head. Two of them. One of them is, he's rich but he's not happy. So, if you don't know, Chris Thorntyke's whole deal is that he's been, like, his parents don't spend any time with him. He grew up basically being raised by the servants. His parents are always gone, and whenever they appear, they're like, Oh, hey, son, we've come back for five minutes to spend with you. Now it's time to go fly off on a helicopter. And he has issues with, like, trust and bonding. And he bonds with Sonic because he thinks he's so cool, and the other characters because... They give him the family he doesn't really have at home. Other than, like, like, his servants are pretty much like his family, but he does have issues with that. That's, like, the whole point. I mean, would you want him to be happy because he's rich? The whole reason Chris is rich is so that Sonic and the gang can just get whatever they want and they don't have to do anything. Like, by which I mean, anytime Sonic and the gang wants to go somewhere, money isn't a problem. Another thing is, there's, like, during one of the finales... Sonic is supposed to go back to his world, and Chris grabs him at the last second and pulls him away, and everyone's like, oh, Chris is a monster for doing this. But, like, Sonic willingly goes with him. Sonic sees what's going on, and he's like, yeah, Chris, I'll go with you. And he basically stays with Chris for a few days, as Chris comes to terms with the fact that Sonic will have to eventually leave. It's just a big emotional moment. I don't know why they're holding it against this kid that he doesn't want his friend to go. I mean, come on. If you had Sonic living in your house for like two months and he didn't totally destroy the place, would you want him to leave? I mean, unless he was like a total mooch, probably not. And yeah, it is the kid aspect. Because nobody held it back to Gregory. Because nobody held it against Charlie and her friends when they attacked the animatronics. In the novels, Charlie and her friends pretty much do a lot to the animatronics. Like, they're uh, flying, kicking them and such. And especially in that one scene where Charlie electrocutes Chica. But nobody really cared because they were defending themselves. It's okay if they do it or if Mike does it. But Gregory? Nah. I've heard people say it's because Gregory does it ruthlessly. But like, the only quote-unquote ruthless one is Chica's. Kind of. Because he presses the button and pushes her in. But then she goes rah and jumps at him anyway. Um, Roxy literally jumps in front of the race car Gregory's driving. And the only reason Gregory's a cold and calculated silent killer is because, like, half of his dialogue was cut, along with most of the game. I'm moving on before I blow a gasket. Ender the Dragon writes, The fizzy fast flavors are shiz. Or more accurately, the selection is trash. Think about it, three-fourths of them are citrus, and the last one is grape. Grape is a really mid-flavor, but I'd be willing to forgive this if the other flavors weren't literally all citruses, because that's just objectively bad in terms of variety. Chica's could have been strawberry. I love strawberry. Monty's could have been sour apple. I think Freddy's is orange could stay, so we have one citrus. 
Could have been cool to see Fizzy Fast flavors of the other characters, but that's not necessary since Sun, Moon, and Bonnie all have candies themed after them. But DJ Music Man deserved to get something too. Give my man a DJ Music Man themed sugary treat. I never noticed until you mentioned this, but yeah, they're practically all citrus. Orange, pink lemonade, sour lime. Having a separate lemon and lime is pretty drastic in itself. This is kinda odd. I agree. Freddy with orange, Chica with strawberry, and Monty with green apple, or maybe lemon lime if you really want it. But then, maybe have Sun Fizzy Fast that's pineapple? A nice tropical flavor to go with the Kids Cove section of the daycare. Moon could be blue raspberry, a deep blue with a nice sour tart, like Moon himself. Bonnie could be cherry. One of the Fizzy Fast messages mentions a cherry flavor that doesn't appear in game. Having Bonnie have the cherry, matches his color scheme, cherry could fit in with like bowling balls, would be great. Because you really couldn't do carrot soda. At least I don't see them doing it. Now, Roxy actually has two flavors, grape and cola. Have Roxy keep cola, it's traditionally in a red can, it's a popular choice, and give the DJ the deep grape instead. That's a full balance of flavors. Basil the Sunflower writes, My hot take. The first one is that I wish the crying child had more of a role in the games. He was there for like one game and that's it. I also wish that he was the sole possessor of Golden Freddy. It just makes more sense to have him possess him since he's the one who had the most theming around him. Well, except for the blatant puppet theming, but shockingly, I agree. I kind of find the whole, let's just stick every extra kid character who we've name dropped into the Golden Freddy hive mind to be a waste of character, both for Golden Freddy and for whoever's stuck in him. After all, there's no confirmation really of which kids are in there because it's always baited and hidden, which means that it's basically a bunch of teasing. Save in the books where they give Golden Freddy a real person inside of him and it's some kid named Michael, so there's that. Second take, I personally find Cassidy to be kind of a boring character. We know nothing about her, and personally her possessing Golden Freddy makes no sense since we never see her possess any form of Golden Freddy. I disagree. Saying that Cassidy has a boring character implies that Cassidy has a character. Yeah, that was a joke. I agree. Cassidy is pretty much just a name that pops up whenever FNAF wants to dangle a hook for their audience. But on the whole, she's nobody. Third one. Andrew or Kelsey would have been a better choice for the one you shouldn't have killed. They both have more personality combined than Cassidy. Of course, these are just my opinion. Can't remember Kelsey too well, but I did like Andrew in the books for the most part. At least, I like the potential that he had with Jake, so I agree. But that's a partially uneducated decision. Peppa Varis writes, Roxy coming back alive in Ruin was pretty cheap. It kind of removes the few emotions I had in the DLC. Also, how did she even get out of the forklift in the first place and know where Cassie is? She's literally blind. Well, she's... Illusion Discs. I think Roxy's comeback might have been a last second decision to make the DLC not so depressing and to give someone to help Cassie escape the Mimic. After all, if Roxy wasn't there, who would have been? The burned up puppet from the underground pizzeria? Moving on. Grace the Fox writes, My hot take. I love Vanny so much. Her design is amazing and I wish she got explored in Ruin instead of the Mimic. It makes me upset they just threw her aside. Also, yes, her being a fangirl is such a better idea than the one we got, like goddamn. Yeah, I agree. I wasn't too pleased with Vanny's execution or the really uncomfy implications of the whole AR email finger breaking thing, but to have her built up and just not used was such a terrible waste. I stand rabbit waifu Van Van. Jennifer Greel writes, Honestly, at this point, I'm more interested in the characters as Fazbear Entertainment presents them in the restaurant than any of the horror aspects or lore about the human characters and undead children murderers. I'd play a whole game just about the characters in-universe. In-universe. Like the universe Freddy and friends inhabit and that the pizzeria Pizza Plex is themed after. God, this is difficult to explain. No, no, I agree. In fact, I'd love that. Why not capitalize on the characters and give us a look at the Freddy's behind the franchise, or the Freddy's franchise in universe? It would be a really cool way to make spinoffs. I know there was FNAF World, but it didn't really use the characters. It was more like children's limbo of Freddy's. But like, imagine a full capitalization as we play as Freddy and friends doing mini games and going on a quest and having fun, and maybe perhaps slowly uncovering the borders of their universe underneath all the cartoonish innocence. Or just 
straight up do FNAF Mario Party. I would play the hell out of FNAF Mario Party. I don't care what anyone says. User... Oh my god. This user writes, I'm not sure if this is a really hot take, but I'm just curious. Why does Steel Wool just pick random characters from Scott's game and say, Oh, nobody cared about them before, but they were actually really super important to the lore this whole time. Case in point, Nightmarian. He went from not being canon to just popping up everywhere in Steel Wool's games, especially Security Breach. Is he actually important to the lore, or does someone higher up in Steel Wool just like him? Uh, hmm. Good point. But going to play Devil's Advocate, maybe it's the theorists' problems for trying to make every little detail hook into the greater story. We are at the point where almost all details or hints are trying to be hooked back to Mimic. But is that on Steel Wolf for not only showing hints relating to the Mimic? Or is that on the folks who want to believe it's all an interconnected conspiracy? That's a thinker. That one random kid writes, My hot take is that Steel Wolf can't keep disregarding the past games. 1-4 to four on Help Wanted saying that it was indie dev's work. Then use the same games as lore for their future games. It muddies everything and I personally find it very confusing. Oh, yeah, 100% agree. I think muddying the waters by making it unclear which games are real and which are fake, which are based on real events, which aren't, was a really big step in how absolutely confusing the storyline is getting. Because now the bigger issue is that the current story is telling us that 1-6 through six did not happen, or at least what we saw was not what actually happened. And that's just great. I don't see that leading to something heavy-handed in the future. Voice from Under the Covers writes, I was in the last one, so maybe I can get this one too. Worth a shot. Henry's speech at the end of Pizzeria Sim comes out of nowhere, dumps a ton of solutions that make solving the prior games impossible without, and feels really unsatisfying. It also doesn't help that we're burning William again. Giving a take that spicy definitely improves your chances. I won't dive too deep into the fire stuff because I did so earlier, but I agree with the Henry stuff. A big info dump stolen from a character who deserved it, Michael, and given to a guy who you won't know about unless you go read the books afterwards. Basically, just good Afton, you know. Never mentioned before, never hinted. A lot of folks like to claim that Henry was planned from the beginning, but Scott said in FNAF 4 that we had all the details to uncover and discover the entire story, and there was no Henry. I crave more Henry slander. Let's see, uh, here we go. Bob writes, Hot take, Henry's speech was not that impactful in the grand scheme of things, especially because he arguably made the problem worse. Also, he looks like a minion. I like the hot take videos. Keep on rocking, not real name. Thank you. But I don't know what you mean by him looking like a minion. He sort of looks more like... Oh my god, you're right. What? Now see, this is the sort of thing that's going to haunt me anytime I see this picture again. This has got to go on the thumbnail. Good god. You, by far, have slandered Henry more in two seconds than I have in like three videos. Congratulations. Octo writes, In the fourth closet graphic novel, Jessica's more of a baddie than Red Dress Charlie. Yes, she is. Hot Charlie comes off a bit too try-hard. Like, who really walks around in a tomato red dress 24-7? Visiting places such as the hospital, a casual diner, friend's house. Like, there's a time and a place for toning that down. And she wears a variation of the same dress on a date. Like, what? Listen, I'm not super fashion forward, but even Charlie wore different clothes on her date. Well, in some of the panels. Jessica looks great in what is really a basic outfit. That's when you know she's got it. Bluejack writes, I do not like the look of the animatronics in Help Wanted, and no, I'm not just talking about the design errors of the models. I'm talking about how, like, the characters themselves. It's like Steel Wool sucked all the life and color out of the characters. Fun fact, I was going to start with I agree, but they're not that bad. And then I pulled up this picture of Springtrap I had on hand, and... Yeah. Okay, they're pretty rough. Now, I think it must have been a limitation of VR or something because Security Breach had models that looked really good, but these Help Wanted models, they look very Play-Doh-like, especially entered. To the point where, when we're comparing them from the same game, the action figure models look cleaner than the in-game models, at least to me. We'll see in Help Wanted too. If the models are rough there, it's a VR thing. If not, it was like early stage development weirdness sort of thing. 
Metal Cat writes, Cassie's transponder had to already be there. One, the mask didn't say it was installing one, it said it was pairing with one, which implies that it used an EMP of some sort to wake it up. Two, the occipital region, I probably pronounced that wrong, is in the back of the brain. No mask is going to be able to drill through bone, slip through brain matter unharmed, and implant a chip in the back of the brain when the dang thing is fixed to her face. It wouldn't work, especially in that fraction of a second. 3. Cassie spent time at the daycare as a small child. It could have easily been implanted if she had been taken to on-site medical if she hurt herself. 4. It also explains why Roxy has such an affinity to her. She's reacting to the chip. I hate this so much because this is exactly the sort of thing FNAF would put into the story to explain brainwashing or hallucinations or Fazbear Entertainment being an evil company somehow implanting chips into all the kids and employees because it will get them to spend more money or something. And something which would, of course, make the story even more heavy-handed and overly complex. I hate that you have a point with this because, God, how I hate this idea. This is exactly the sort of contrived thing that would get added into the story in a waved-away line to just be used to explain whenever something doesn't make sense or when someone does something that doesn't make sense. We can only hope that the pairing transponder, all of that stuff was just sciencey babble that wasn't thought that deeply about because that too could always be the case, hopefully, God willing. Green Sam writes, hot take, sun, moon, and eclipse are overrated. Also, I know for a fact that the burn trap ending was the canon ending in Security Breach, but in Ruin they backpedaled. No and yes, no, I think the daycare attendant is great and I understand why people have latched onto them. Yes, I think the burn trap was the original true ending and they decided to go a different direction in Ruin, making Vanessa a protagonist again and axing Vanny for Mimic. So they switched to the other ending that was a possible true ending, the three star ending. Not a terrible idea since there was such a backlash against burn trap, but not to say that I give a flying rat's accent about Mimic though. Um, Chile anyway, so, writes, I don't understand why people desperately cling onto William Afton and the old story of FNAF. That chapter is over. The sixth game was the final. Now we have a new villain and a new protagonist. The story is headed in a much different direction. So can we stop trying to revive William constantly? He already survived one fire. He can't and shouldn't survive two. He was a man who did some really bad things to reach an unreachable goal. And of course he failed miserably trying to do so. He wasn't a supervillain who just refused to die or a mad scientist who was proud of the outcome of his actions. Please let the man die along with the story. Allow me to retort. Cassidy, making Gregory look like the crying child. Burn Trap, adding in further lore about the old games being falsified. It's not the fans who are desperately clinging on, it's FNAF. Why do you think we've had so many fires? So many almost identical villains. FNAF acts like it wants to move on, but it has serious commitment issues. And it baits its audience. Of course, people are going to think Afton's coming back when this shows up. Also, if I can make a quick note here that everyone seems to forget. Um, Glitchtrap's only known line, which was hidden in the Princess Quest minigame, was I always come back, which is William Afton's catchphrase. I do agree that we should let Afton die. Shame the concepts Afton brought with him didn't die. Always some person in a costume luring kids. Except now, instead of Afton, it's Endoskeleton. An Endoskeleton with a backstory of Charlie's circus baby in the books. Which has led to the whole deal with people theorizing that it is circus baby. The chapter isn't over. We're still playing around with the missing children incident 50 years later. Def Not My Burner writes, My hot takes are that the series got worse by sister location and all the sci-fi watered it down. Like I said in my Sister Location video, I don't think this can be pinned on Sister Location alone. But I do think the overindulgence in sci-fi themes has affected how grounded the series is. Case in point, the transponder nightmare I mentioned a few minutes ago. Anyway, let's continue. The other take is that Afton was never meant to be the co-owner in the series. Especially if you just look at FNAF 1-4, to there's no hint or clue. In fact, the only time they mention an owner is when Fungi said it in FNAF 2, and he says owner, not owners. And Afton is always pictured wearing a security outfit, even when he killed Charlie, which contradicts with him disguising himself as a night shift guard. 
since she was the absolute first. So why would he ever wear a security outfit when he's the co-owner and have zero reason to wear it? I agree. I think that the Purple Man wasn't originally supposed to be an owner. I think it was a concept added around the time the Silver Eyes came out because the story got a greater, let's say, like, got a microscope over it. And either to fill in the plot hole of how he always got away scot-free or to add additional drama of having him be the Judas of the main character's father, it was decided to have him be a former owner. I still stand by the belief that at some point either Mike or Phone Guy was the murderer, and this was changed as the story progressed. So yeah, I don't think Will was always a thing, let alone always an owner. All Me Too writes, The whole Cassie's dad being a new character and not Bonnie Bro is so ugh to me if it's true. I don't know, it's too many newer characters, like it was Vanessa, then Gregory, now Cassie, and on top of that, her and her whole ever family? I don't know, bruh. To me, adding any more newer characters will just make me not care about them in general because I at least want to learn about Cassie more before we start zooming to even more characters. Plus, the thought of Bonnie Bro coming back after the trauma he witnessed with this fight seems pretty tied all together, in my opinion. Hence why he likes Bonnie a lot. That's just me, though. I'm not theory smart or anything, lol. So, I don't want Cassie's dad to become a character because I know, like Henry, he will completely overshadow everyone else and become the main focus, the main whoopee, the main victim. FNAF's got daddy issues, and we really don't need another daddy to show up. The idea that we had just got this new character and now she'll get shafted this quickly is disappointing. The unfortunate part is that people latched so hard on the Cassie's dad that now he's going to appear. Steelwool has likely seen the response and are already trying to figure out how to work in Henry 2.0. That's going to suck. But I absolutely disagree on the Bonnie bully thing. A lot of people like this idea not seeming to understand that that would mean that Cassie's dad would be at least 50 years old, probably pressing 60. And Cassie's like 12. She looks 8, but I think she's supposed to be 12. Now, he could be her grandpa, but still, why make the story messier by adding in a random connection to a character who appeared once ages ago? That's the sort of issue that was mentioned earlier about constantly bringing back old characters. Sometimes less is more. Chameleon writes, the book hate is extremely unwarranted. I don't remember which it is, but one of the Fazbear Frights books has a story where the main character is a man who was horribly abused by his father. There's even heavy implications of, um, S.A. in the text, if you know what I mean. Which was not an overreaction. I noticed it too once I read it. And then he is tormented and killed by Springtrap, who he keeps imagining as his abusive father as he regresses into a childish state. I can talk about how lazy the books are, the springtrap impreg, the insensitive takes on cancer and mental illness, the gross implications, the excessive gore described to school children, the story that's a big reference to My Hero Academia and the character who's voiced by Kellen Goff. Sexy baby, hot Charlie, doormat Charlie, sexy anime waifus, and the implication that you must now purchase or otherwise get a hold of the books to get important story details. There's so much wrong with the books, but if you hate them, yeah, I have one good example of why you could justifiably hate them. Abrahamster Lives writes, I hate how people characterize Willie Afton as a dude who loves wearing purple. Unless I missed something from Scott, I always thought he was just colored purple because he was meant to be a shadowy figure. The 8-bit games would use purple to signify shadows. He's not actually wearing purple. It doesn't even fit his personality to wear purple all the time. Michael is the one who is actually physically purple. Like Docco that time he waxed his legs for charity. What? Anywho, that's something that's always bothered me. I regret to inform you, bud, but as of the fourth closet graphic novel, William Afton has been confirmed to be the type of person to lounge around in a gaudy purple bathrobe 24-7. Now, I'm not saying your comment doesn't have merit, but alas, this picture exists. Though William's bathrobe does change color a few times throughout the book, so... Scamp Lanop writes, William is a better father than Henry. He first made baby on Elizabeth's image and told her it was for her. It's a lie, but it shows that he was somewhat close to her. And he also was cruel to Michael, but he sent him to free his sister. He, Michael, was like his right hand. 
And then we have Henry. He made the puppet to guard his child instead of him because he was busy. I have to disagree. Every instance we see of William being a parent shows him to either be selfish, negligent, manipulative, or in the books, physically abusive. William is definitely the worst parent, no doubt about it. However, I do agree that Henry isn't the goody-goody parent everyone wants to believe. Like, William's a god-awful father and a terrible person. He's a monster, no doubt about it. Henry's a deadbeat dad who's so wrapped up in his own victimization that he neglects the suffering of others, makes extremely questionable decisions, but is painted as a martyr. There's no good parent and bad parents here. There's two bad dads that share shades of the same issues. William is the worst example, but Henry's not squeaky clean. Someday I'll make a little video about Sammy Emily, for some reason. A shark writes, Excellent, I missed the last one and I hope I'm not too late this time. I got some hot takes with some salt. Hot take number one, the mimic shouldn't have been added into the games. Let's be real and frank here. The Mimic is nothing but a cheap, lazy cop-out when things with Afton didn't go over well. Not only that, I have yet to see anyone explain why the Mimic is so interested in recreating William Afton. It has no motive or compelling reason to do so. But my biggest problem with the Mimic is that it makes Vanny completely worthless, as it took everything away from her. She was supposed to be a successor to William who carries on his legacy in her own unique way. But now we have a generic evil robot that kills because someone was violent towards it. Which isn't even original and has been done way better. Like the AI from Nine, for example. I agree with everything you say here, and I've mentioned it earlier. But yes, let me gush on the fabrication machine from Nine. You wouldn't think it's a complex character, but it actually is. Especially with the scientist journal adding additional but not excessively needed connotations. The fabrication machine is a robot built to create. The scientists who created it made it with this purpose, taught it and bonded with it, even played games with it. And then the government swooped in and took it to use during the Great War, working it harder than it was supposed to be pressed. That's what's actually mentioned in the journal, everything else was in the movie. Forcing it to create machines to use during the war, poison toxins capable of wiping out humans and fauna, and at some point it snaps and turns on the humans. The scientist speculates that this is because it doesn't have a human soul, but I think it's worth considering that the machine does show emotions. When the soldiers forcibly remove the scientist, the machine is upset and then lashes out at the soldiers. It even makes a noise of pain when they first implant it into the new shell they created for it to create with. And it seems to grow more lively over the course of the movie. You could say that's because it's gaining more of a soul, but I, I think it actually has, like, a personality, because it shows it in the flashback. The machine, too, is a victim, or it was before it turned on the humans. And it turned on them not because it believed itself better, but because... Well, maybe because it was doing exactly what they were telling it to. If you think about it, the fabrication machine went exactly with the directive that they gave to it. Make a bunch of machines to kill a bunch of humans. Too long didn't listen, the fabrication machine is so cool, and so is Nine. Okay, moving on. Hot take two, Ruin was a mid-DLC. Now let me make it clear, I am not saying Ruin was awful, or anyone likes it, that you should be ashamed. I hate the fact that I need to state this. I found Ruin very underwhelming and boring, and the story was just a mess like Security Breach. It wasn't even scary despite Steel Wool claiming as such. But that wasn't my biggest concern, the gameplay was so simple and repetitive that I barely played the game as I got bored quickly. I also didn't like how they handled some of the characters like Chica and Monty. And a lot of the sections felt really very tacked on and rushed like the daycare, for example. I did enjoy a few things like the Freddy section, that was my favorite, I just wish it was longer. All in all, Ruin just didn't do it for me, and I was rather disappointed and I didn't even have high expectations for it. Yeah, I agree. I got really annoyed with the tediousness of the first half and quit, and just watched someone else play the rest and honestly, I kind of feel like I would have enjoyed Ruin a lot more if I had just done that for the whole thing, because that gameplay. It may be taking inspiration from the Dark Revival, which I appreciate, but it ain't Dark Revival, toots. Hot Take 3. Moon got the short end of the stick. I've mentioned this in past comments, so I'll keep it brief. They did my boy Moon so dirty in the games in terms of character and story. I never liked how Moon is constantly characterized as creepy and evil, and that's it. 
but biggest problem is how we save them in Ruin. You do it by metaphorically killing Moon after you basically torture him. I was extremely uncomfortable listening to Moon crying out in pain while turning on the generators. And we need to talk about what Sun meant by reboot, because the context does matter. If he's referring to a soft reboot, think for starting your phone, that is not a guarantee that it will fix what's wrong with Moon. If anything, it could make him more spiteful and vengeful. And if it's a hard reboot, like a factory reset, then dear lord, a hard reboot deletes all data on the device setting back to its original factory settings. So whoever Moon was would be long gone and his factory settings would merge with Sun. Bro got screwed over hard. And if I may, it does definitely seem like if you think about how Eclipse is acting, it definitely seems like it was a hard reboot situation. I know they tacked on Sun saying thank you afterwards, but he doesn't seem like he's still there. And when you put it like that, it does kind of seem like we killed Moon. And we didn't really even get a read on what his deal was. The panic screams of no sun, no sun. It feels like there's something more there, but in the end, he and really Sun are axed. Sun says something, but he should be gone, and are erased and replaced with a blissfully unaware but friendly personality. It's almost like we lobotomized the daycare attendant. Sure, he was suffering at that point, but what's going to happen now? That's a thinker. Hot take number four, people need to lay off Gregory. I know this has been mentioned before that people need to stop slandering Greg. I just want to add in some things. For one, people need to be reminded that Gregory is a child. And newsflash, children are a-holes by nature. I've babysitted kids and I'm well aware of how kids Gregory's age behave. And come on, I can guarantee you people had some troublemaker moments when they were his age. When I was a kid, not only would I constantly run off on my parents and if I was restrained, I would scream and cry embarrassing them. And oh wow, Gregory lied about something. I have never seen a kid lie about stuff. Sarcasm. Also, I dislike GGY theories as for one, why would Glitchtrap need a kid to complete his goals rather than an adult Fanny? And don't tell me it was because it would be less obvious that plan backfired in the therapy chafes where both the therapist and staff members figured him out. Well, yeah, Glitchtrap really dropped the ball on that one. Oh, but I guess I'm not supposed to think about that and just ignore that part. Also, stop using Gregory's hesitation to give Freddy his name as evidence of him being a robot or brainwashed. It's not, and it never was. No, it wasn't. It was Freddy shoving his face down and, Who oh, was your name, little boy? Yeah, I'd be like, ugh, you know. Yeah, I will never understand why people give Vanessa a pass and not Gregory. But I can tell you, if Gregory was a cute adult security guard, one with an edgy side and a tragic past, they would give him a pass. Because I can tell you now, people would not be this upset if Michael scrapped the animatronics. Also, yeah, the GGY thing kind of has always bothered me because it doesn't make any sense. A small child would have less of an ability to venture around the pizza plex in comparison to the main security guard. And finally, hot take number five, Roxy's character and personality. While Roxy does have a nice design, I am not a fan of her character and personality. I know and understand that she's supposed to be insecure, but that is not an excuse to lash out at others and drag others down so you can feel better about yourself. She also has no reason to be so harsh to Gregory in Security Breach before he took her eyes. Seriously, telling an orphan that no one will miss you and you are nothing is incredibly cruel. Like, gee, I wonder why Gregory doesn't like you, Roxy. And don't use the glitch virus as both Security Breach and Ruin show she has enough self-awareness to recognize her actions. You would think that she would be nicer to Gregory since he's good friends with Cassie, unless, oh good grief, is Roxy aggressive towards Gregory because she sees him as competition for Cassie's friendship? As much as that makes sense, I don't like the idea as it makes Roxy look even worse. Gregory doesn't deserve all the blame on the raceway as Roxy intentionally jumped onto the track in front of him, putting herself in danger. I also never felt much of anything for that scene in Ruin with Cassie as it feels like a cheap please cry now moment. That gets ruined when she shows up to save Cassie from the Mimic. Also, how on earth did she even get pinned under the forklift then make her way down to Cassie while blind? Oh man, yeah. Yeah, Roxy gets the waifu pass in behavior, to be entirely honest. It happens. After all, Manny. And not much to say that I didn't say earlier. I do like Roxy. Actually, in hindsight, I kind of think that doling her down in ruin made her a little worse. 
because you can kind of feel how they tried to soften her up to make her more approachable, more um, marketable to the audience, and that kind of feels like a backpedal for her character. Oh, also, I apologize for the long, super long comment. I just wanted to share my takes. I hope you got to enjoy it. I did, thank you. And now, for the last hot take, we're going to do one of my own. Funny story, but we've been building to this hot take throughout this entire video. In fact, this hot take was spawned while I was recording this video. Initially, my hot take was going to be something like, I don't know, I wouldn't be disappointed if Mexis was some sort of computer program copy of Michael Afton because Michael would have still technically moved on, but maybe we could do something more with his character since he kind of got shafted a little in Pizzeria Simulator, you know, anything but Mexis is Afton. But then I got another idea. This is an off script though, because I tried this off script and it sounded very rambly and I would like to get my point across very clearly. So, Roxy appearing at the end to rescue Cassie causes two major problems. Firstly, the tear-jerking scene of Roxy getting shut down feels like more of an emotional ploy than anything else, because it is erased so quickly almost immediately afterwards. And even then, if you listen afterwards, Roxy's getting her tail handed to her by Mimic. I don't know, being shut off blissfully unaware seems like a better final moment than having Mimic mimicking Roxy and then smashing her head open against a wall. This has nothing to do with my earlier thoughts on how Roxy was handled. That's just my inner writer saying that plot point A and B happened too closely together. Whole thing could have been rewritten to make it flow a little better. The second big issue is the how. So, Cassie leaves Roxy and heads down into the sinkhole, squeezes through the tunnels, and spends only a few minutes shutting off Mexis before getting into where Mimic is. This means Roxy pretty much had to get up, get that forklift off of her in a matter of seconds, and followed after Cassie into the sinkhole completely blind, questionable elevator and all. So much for one trip down, am I right? All in all, Roxy saving Cassie doesn't just not make sense, but it makes that emotional moment moot too early. Like, you could totally have Roxy return, but not two seconds after the moment. So... Who else could have rescued Cassie? Well, I think it should have been the puppet. And I know we were talking about characters returning and messiness, but hear me out. Firstly, the puppet is the only animatronic who stood a good chance of surviving the pizzeria simulator fire. Not only was it trapped inside of Lefty, but Lefty was not shown being burned. A partially burned puppet could still be trapped down in the building. Plus, this would give some credence to the fact that we're actually using this building for the Mimic confrontation, even though, by all accounts, he has no direct connection with Pizzeria Simulator. It could have really been just anything down here. It could have just been like a secret basement where people were doing laboratory experiments. It didn't have to be this. Secondly, we are told through the games and directly by Henry that the puppet is a protector of children. In Ultimate Custom Night, the puppet proclaims itself, um, himself, lol, a protector as well, though for the animatronics, who are mostly possessed by dead kids. But we don't ever see the puppet being a protector. We are just told that it is. What a great way to show it. The puppet flings itself out of the wreckage of the fire, broken and burned, to protect a child whom it has no previous attachment to. It doesn't rescue Cassie because she's its friend. It rescues Cassie because that's what it does. It protects. FNAF loves twists, and this one wouldn't take any extra brain work to figure out. You could say, but the puppet mask is on the blob. But the puppet mask is not visible unless you hack to get behind it. And, well, I think. And in an ending that's considered non-canon now. Besides, you can easily wave that away as another mask. FNAF 3 showed that there was near duplicate puppet masks. It would be a little bit of a stretch, but I feel like the payoff would be worth it, and it's no more of a stretch than the whole Roxy thing. And I know what you'll say, but that makes Henry's freeing of the children pointless. Except, did Henry free the children? Help Wanted and Security Breach make it clear that the earlier FNAF games are not to be trusted or relied on. So, who's to say that actually happened at all? And yes, I'm being particularly petty, but this is the plot element that was decided on. I shouldn't have to adhere to a plotline they claim isn't correct, right? 
Or heck, if it's really that much of an issue, have it be the security puppet. Or the original puppet from the Pizzeria Simulator minigame, since that one looks different from the FNAF 2 one. Heck, the rubbery striped arm and lefty doesn't resemble the limbs on any of the puppets. Different puppet entirely. My point is, you could make this work. This is the fan service DLC, right? Why not get some real fan service in there? Especially since, in all likelihood, we probably won't see the puppet in a major role ever again, unless it's revealed to be the mimic. I don't know, it's just a thought. Because if the twist was the mimic, yeah, everybody knew it. Even if you didn't know about the mimic, like from the books, from the moment Grimmick opens its mouth, you know it's not Gregory. The real twist is that an actually good FNAF character appears at the end. But that's just me. Anyway, thank you for listening to these hot takes. I hope you're not too burned. I hope you had some fun, and I hope you didn't take anything too seriously, because these are just opinions, and we all have them. And just because we're critical of FNAF doesn't mean we don't like FNAF. It doesn't mean we hate FNAF. It means that we love FNAF, and we just want to see FNAF be the best it possibly can. Anywho, thank you for watching.